It's been a long time, Okay. I'm not gonna throw it though. Start the camera. I did. It's it's running right now at this very moment. All right. Thank you. Okay. So uh, don't forget tomorrow night at seven o'clock. We're talking more about it, but we're gonna we'll have the telescope out, and uh, hopefully it works. We'll see. All right. So here's where we add in terms of the big picture. So. Depending, depending on how the day goes, we'll determine whether or not the test is Thursday or Friday over centripetal motion and gravity. It's going to be one of the two days. We'll see how it plays out. So here's where we're at historically. First, they had the geocentric model. So said, we're the center of the universe. And that made us feel good. Okay, here, so here's the best analogy I can give. It's like we found that everything revolved around us. It's like the ultimate freshman mentality. Okay? We're the center of the universe and everything moves around us. So it'd be like, let's say for example, every day since you were in kindergarten, your mom packs your lunch. And every day she writes notes and says, We're special, love you, hugs, hugs and kisses, mom. Okay? Every day for since you were in kindergarten. You've got a note in your lunchbox that says, love you, you're special. Okay? You feel good about that, right? Yes. And then all of a sudden, you get a note that says, you're just like everybody else. Okay? <laughs> well, no, and that, that's how it was when we figured that on, on the heliocentric solar system, okay? We're just like all the other planets. We, we, we revolve around the sun just like everybody else does. It was like, well, that was kind of disheartening. It was like, we were special, you know? God made us in his own likeness and put us in the center of the universe. And then it was like, now you're just like everybody else. And so that was, a, that was a bit of a crest fall. So then Tico goes out, collects all the data. Nicholas Copernicus or has the first one that says, hey, we're in a heliocentric solar system, he publishes that after his passing. Johannes Kepler comes along, steals Tycho's data, goes back, comes up with the three laws of planetary motion. So this is early 1600s, okay? So then Isaac Newton comes along and he talks about gravity, because Kepler really never tried to explain the mechanism. He just said, he's like a reporter. He goes, here's the news. I don't know why it happened, but it happened. So Newton comes along and says, well, let's talk about gravity. So Newton came up with this equation that F equals big G M1 M2 over D squared. Now, Newton was a, Newton was, this is important, Newton was a big idea kind of guy. He, he wasn't going to worry about the details. So this big G, what, how Newton proposed this, this is just a constant of proportionality. Newton didn't know what the number was. He just says, hey, there's going to be a number, and I'm going to let somebody else find that number. I'm not going to worry about it. I've got other things to worry about. I'm going to let somebody else do that. It's not my thing. Okay? So what he said, though, was that the gravitational force between two objects, if you're going to calculate that force, once you find that constant of proportionality, is dependent upon three things and three things only. The two masses and how far apart they are. Okay? So, what this means is that you are gravitationally attracted to everything that exists in the universe. Okay? Obviously, you are gravitationally attracted to this rock that we're on. Okay, I dropped something. Hey, it falls. You're gravitationally attracted to the moon, to the sun, to Saturn, to Jupiter. Okay? You are gravitationally attracted to all of these things. You are gravitationally attracted to the most distant electron on the most distant side of the universe. Okay? So the only way you can be in zero gravity is the ultimate freshman mentality. The only way you can be in zero gravity is if you are the only thing that exists in the universe. Okay? If there is anything else in the universe, you are going to be gravitationally attracted to that. Okay? So, if I want to calculate the gravitational attraction between any two objects in the universe, I only need to know three things. The two masses and how far apart they are. Okay? So, let's say that here's Jack Ring. Okay? Here's Jack. We'll even get some nice hair. And let's say that, math, that Jack has a mass of 50 kilograms. And on the wall over there, there is a fire extinguisher. And let's say that that has a mass of 2 kilograms, 
and they are separated by a distance of five meters. Okay? So we can calculate the gravitational attraction between Jack, the fire extinguisher, and all I have to know are their two masses and how far apart they are. Now, obviously there's a lot of things that I worry about when I walk in and start to teach any given class. One of the things that really doesn't cross my mind is the possibility of that fire extinguisher being pulled off the wall and being accelerated towards Jack. Okay? Not something I want to worry about. Okay? Could happen. Probably not. So, if we want to calculate that, and I'll, I'll talk about what big G is in just a second. So, for right now, I'm just going to leave that as a blank. And then we got 50 kilograms times 2 kilograms divided by 5 meters squared. Okay, so this is as far as, as Newton got. He says, look, here's Jack, there's the fire extinguisher, here's this distance. There's going to be some number that's going to go in there. I want to let somebody else figure that out. So who took on that challenge was a guy by the name of Henry Cavendish. So Cavendish developed a scheme where he had a torsion wire. Torsion wire just means that if you're going to twist this wire, it takes a certain amount of force to make this thing twist. So he had this torsion wire. And he took two large copper spheres and he suspended them from each end. Okay, so imagine here's this wire, like a big T, and he had these two large copper spheres on the end of each end. Then he had lead spheres out here, and what he noticed is that when he brought those spheres together, they would begin to twist. Okay, so this is this is how sensitive his, his equipment was. He actually had a room built onto his house to house this equipment. So he didn't want to be in the room because he was afraid his own mass and gravitational field would affect the results. So literally, it's like, okay, he goes, I, didn't, I don't want to be a part of this. This has to be independent of me. So if you look at what Cavendish was able to do, once that wire twisted, he knew how much force it took to twist the wire. Okay, so then he knew the force part of it. So then... He knew the two masses, the copper and the lead sphere, so he knew those two, and he knew how far apart they were. So the only thing he didn't know was big G. So Cavendish basically said, hey, I'm going to take F times distance squared and divide that by mass 1 and mass 2. And he got 6.67 times 10 to the 9 negative 11th Newton meters squared over kilogram square. Now the units kind of look jacked up, okay, but they work because this is a measure of force. So if we want to calculate the gravitational attraction between Jack and that fire extinguisher, we're going to take 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11th newtons meters squared over kilograms squared. Now look what happens. So here I've got kilograms times kilograms, that gives me kilograms squared. That's going to cancel out the kilograms squared on the bottom. I've got meters squared here, that's going to cancel that out. The only thing I have left is newtons, voila, that's what forces measure. Now what I would recommend, this big G is known as the universal gravitational constant, meaning that we have never seen a situation where this number changes. What I would recommend, because we're going to use this number a lot, is that I would store this number in the calculator, in the memory cell of your calculator. Okay, usually there's like an STO button, and calculators now usually have like an alphanumeric, you know, system where you can store that. But when you punch this in, do not punch it in at 6.67 times 10. Hit that 6.67, and then you mo most of you are going to have like an e, e key or an EXP. Don't punch it in as times 10, or it's going to screw up your order of operations. Okay? So I've got 6.67, e to the negative 11, and store that as G or whatever you want to call it. We're going to end up storing like three different values. We're going to store that. We're eventually going to store the mass of the Earth, and we're going to store the radius theory. 
Okay, so those are all values that, that we're going to store eventually. This is going to be the first one. Now, trust me on this one. This unit on gravitational acceleration, and gravitational forces, things like that, you have the potential to get answers that make absolutely no sense if you do not punch them into your calculator correctly. Like my AP physics students just took this test you already take. They took it on Friday. And they had to find the mass of like a planet. The moon was over and they had to find the mass of the planet. And one student got like an answer that was basically 30 times the mass of our sun, which would mean it would have been a black hole and everything around it would have gotten consumed. Uh, so that's what I'm telling you. You have the capacity to get numbers that make no sense if you don't enter them in your calculator correctly. So I'm begging you, try this, make sure that you can run your calculator. So here's what I want to do. So we're going to do this and see if we can calculate the gravitational attraction between Jack and the fire extinguisher. Okay, so somebody take 6.67 times 10 to the 11th, or your memory cell, basically times 100, and then divide that by 25. And if you really want to get clever, that's 25 into 50, that goes 2, 2 times 2 is 10. So basically, you're going to take G times 6, 7, or you're going to take G times 4. That's the short version. So let me know what you get. 2.668 times 10 to the negative 10. Cool. Uh -huh. What you get? It's on the board. <laughs> okay. So, not very much. Okay. But there is a force. Okay. There is a force. So, what this would mean is this. Imagine that we could take Jack and put Jack in deep, 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 deep space where Jack is the only thing around. And then over here, we're going to put the fire extinguisher. Okay? Now, who's going to feel more force? Jack or the fire extinguisher? Or will they both feel the same amount of force? Um, that, I feel like that. Well, they would feel the same amount. Why, Sam? Because that's the force right there. 2.668 times 10. What's Newton's third law? Uh, the force is equal to... Every reaction has an action. I mean, yes. <laughs> For every action, there is a... Reaction. So, they are both going to feel that same amount of force. Okay? When the moon is orbiting the Earth, okay, everybody says, oh... The Earth is pulling on the Moon. Well, guess what? What is the Moon doing? Pulling on the Earth. It's back on the Earth with an equal opposite force, which is why we have tides. What's okay? stopping them from moving, though? It is moving. No, I mean, like, it's obviously gravity, right? Yeah, and in fact, it's bolted onto the wall. So, like, <laughs> but, does, but do they not point, feel like off <laughs> difference? the difference? That's what I was wondering. <laughs> Okay, so here, here's where I'm going with the story. If you could put the two of them in deep, deep, deep space where there is nothing else around, okay, nothing else around, this is the force that they would feel. So what would happen is that Jack would begin to accelerate towards the fire extinguisher, and the fire extinguisher would begin to accelerate towards Jack. Now, which one is going to accelerate faster, the fire extinguisher or Jack? Fire extinguisher. Fire extinguisher, why? That's part of it. Well, look at F equals MA. The force. They're the same force, right? So the fire extinguisher has less, so it's going to have a greater acceleration. Okay? It has less mass, it has less inertia, it's going to accelerate faster. So what's going to happen is that they're going to begin to drift towards each other. Now, funny thing happens. As they drift towards each other, what happens to the gravitational force between them? Increases. Why? Because the radius decreases. Yeah, you're dividing by a smaller and smaller number. Okay? As you divide by a smaller and smaller number, the gravitational force gets bigger. So the rate of acceleration is actually going to increase as they get closer and closer and closer because the force is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay? 
And so this is what happens basically to allow us to be here. And it's like, what does this equation have to do with us being here? Well, if you look at what happened after the Big Bang, conveniently, there were slight distortions in the density of the, of the gases that were formed after the Big Bang. So what happens is that you had pockets where you had slightly more dense gas. That created a gravitational field. That then pulled in more mass around it. That mass got bigger. That increased the gravitational field. So it became like this, this self-fulfilling prophecy. So it gained more mass. It gained more gravitational force. That pulled in more mass. Eventually, you reach a point where you had stars that formed. Oh, hydrogen under in intense pressure and heat formed into helium. Oh, now we have stars. So after the big, everybody says, oh, the Big Bang, you make it sound like it's loud and there's light and all this good stuff. There wasn't any, okay? You didn't have stars until after the universe cooled down and you actually began to have hydrogen and then you had gravity. So if, you, if, if the distribution of mass after the Big Bang had been completely uniform, we wouldn't be here having this discussion because you would have never had stars that formed. So, but because you had slight distortions in the distribution of that mass, that created a gravitational field, that pulled in more hydrogen, that started the fusion process, hydrogen formed into helium, that generation of stars exploded, went supernova, that's where you began to form like the materials that make up, make us, the, the, the nitrogen, the carbon, the, the more complex elements, okay, and even then, that generations of stars then formed, exploded, kicked out, and then eventually we end up here. So it, it's, it's a, kind of a cool thing that says we are all made of stardust, and it is, because all of the complex atoms that make you up at one point were formed in a star that exploded, got kicked out, all of that material then ended up with us being able to hear have this discussion. Okay, so here's the point. If you were to look at the gravitational force between Jack and the fire extinguisher and distance, what would that graph look like? Mm. Distance would be decrease, but the force and be would be direct. Inverse. No, way. Like, 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 when is Jack and the fire extinguishers going to have their greatest attractive force? When they're close or when they're far away? Close. close. Zero. So he's going to have his greatest force at the top. At the top. And then as you increase the distance between Jack and the fire extinguisher, the force is going to decrease. Okay? So it's going to do something like this. Oh, yeah, because it's a curve. Yeah, it's an exponential Now, at this point, Jack is kind of flipped out. Jack's going, I'm not taking this whole fire extinguisher thing and feeling the force towards it. Because Jack now subconsciously is starting to lean towards the fire extinguisher. So Jack's going to get up and he's going to move so that he's 10 meters away. Okay? So Jack's going, I'm out of here. I'm going to go, I'm going to move so that I'm 10 meters away. He's going to go sit in the back of the room. Okay? Now, Jack moves to a distance of 10 meters away. Quantitatively, what's going to happen to the attractive force? Decrease. Is it going to increase or decrease? Decrease. 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 Why? Dividing by a bigger number. I'm dividing by a bigger number, right? So if Jack moves to 10 meters away, everything is going to stay the same, right? Universal gravitational constant is a constant. That's by its name. It's not going to change. Then his mass is still 50 kilograms. The fire extinguisher is still two kilograms, but instead of dividing by five meters, now we're going to divide by ten meters. Okay? So now somebody take big G times ten kilograms, no, fifty, I'm sorry, fifty kilograms times two kilograms, and we're going to divide that by ten meters squared. 6.67 times, yeah, because this is 100, right? 10 squared is 100. 50 times 2 is 
100, you basically get 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons. Notice it did not go to zero. But here's the question. The first force that we had was 2.6, whatever that number was, 668. Six, go away. Times 10 to the negative 10th. So what number is bigger, 10 to the negative 10th or 10 to the negative 11th? Ten. That's the bigger number. Now, so humor me. Somebody take 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th and divide that into 2.668 times 10 to the negative 10th. I want to make a comparison. So take the smaller, take that bigger number, 2.668 times 10 to the negative 10th, and divide it by 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. 25. I got four, personally. Four, four. <laughs> or four. Okay. Now, notice that it went up by a factor of four. Leslie, you seem quite excited about that prospect. Why? Oh, it makes sense, right? So this is what's known as an inverse square law, right? So we doubled the distance, but the force became one-fourth as much, okay? So because we doubled the distance, it shrinks by a factor of four. If we triple the distance, Jack says, I'm going 15 meters away. Then it would go by, down by a factor of nine because it's an inverse square relationship. Now, is it possible for Jack to ever, for that force to ever go to zero? Jack says, I'm out of here. I'm moving to California. No. No. No, no matter where Jack goes on this earth, Jack is always going to feel a gravitational pull towards that fire extinguisher. What if the distance is zero? Then it just becomes, then it just... It's it not does. real. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about that, because I was like, it never hits the y-axis on the graph. Yes, it just becomes like undefined. Yeah. So, Makes sense. Okay. So here's what I want you to see. Okay. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen. To me. If now the other side of this, if you sh if Jack goes, oh, I like that fire extinguisher. Okay. I like that you feeling know. of attraction. Jack gets up and he walks towards the fire extinguisher, and he goes to a distance of two and a half meters. <laughs> If he goes to a distance of two and a half meters, what's going to happen to the force? It's going to go uh, up by a factor of four. four. Okay? Yeah. It's going to go up by a factor of four. Ah, oh, Jack's going, oh, dig it, man. Feeling it, okay? So, this is an inverse square relationship. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to take this idea and we're going to see what happens to the gravitational attraction between Mercury and the Sun as it goes around in its orbit. Okay? So, here's what you've got. This is where this goes back to that lab that we've been working on. So, I'm guessing your graph looks something like this, okay? So, what you should have on that graph is the single point where Mercury is going fastest, <coughs> the single point where Mercury is going slowest, a region where it's slowing down, and a region where it's speeding up. Okay, so I should clearly be able to look at your graph at this point and see four distinct things. A single point in that orbit where it's going fastest, a single point where it's going slowest, a region where it's speeding up, and a region where it's slowing down. Okay? And if you're if that isn't if you're not sure if that's clearly labeled, give your graph to the person beside you and go, hey, can you figure that out? Okay? And if that person goes, I, can, I have no idea what you're doing, okay? Then I certainly am not going to have an idea, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. For now, we are not going to calculate the actual force that exists between Mercury and the Sun. We will. We're just not going to do it right now. What we're going to find is what's called a relative amount of force. Okay, we're not going to calculate the entire thing. We're just going to look at a relative amount of force. So we're going to do this to get, we're going to do the first points together. Okay. So on line two, on that third page, 
we want to find the distance from Mercury to the Sun when it, when it, is, it is at its furthest point. So look through that data, find the biggest distance between Mercury and the Sun. What do you get? 0.467 um, AE. Yeah. Right? Yes. Okay? That's the same for everybody. That's when it's at its furthest point. Now, when it's at its furthest point, is that gravitational point the weakest or the strongest? Weakest, right? Because that's when it's at its greatest distance. That's when that gravitational force is at its weakest. Now, on line three, I want to find the distance when it's closest. So what's the single closest distance that you have? 0 0.307. 0 0.307. 0 0.307. 0 0.307. So that's the point where this is going to be the strongest gravitational force, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this as a ratio and try and figure out the amount of change. This is, this is a relative scale. Listen to me. This is not Newton's. This is a relative change in the force. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to find that single point when Mercury is at its furthest orbit, when it is far away from Mercury, or when Mercury is as far away from the Sun as it's ever going to be. And you're going to come in here and you're going to draw a line pointing towards the Sun that's going to be one centimeter long. So what we're saying is that when Mercury is at its furthest point, it has a relative force of one. This is not one Newton. You are not going to keep Mercury in orbit around the Sun by exerting one Newton of force on it. Okay? This is not a Newton. This is just a relative amount of force that says this has a value of one. Now, what we want to do is figure out how much that force changes at its closest point. Okay? So what we're going to do is this handy dandy little ratio because we're comparing forces. And basically, big G's, the M's, and everything cancels out because we're talking about a ratio. So what we're going to do is we're going to take 1 over D1 over D2 quantity squared. Because it's a ratio of D squared. So that's why that 2 is out there. So what we're going to do is we're going to take 1 over, we're going to take D1, which is 0 0.307 AU's, <clears throat> divide that by 0.467 AUs, and then we're going to square that number, okay? So first off, what units am I going to have out of this? Do not make this difficult. AU, no, no. AU squared? No, no. 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 nothing. I won't have any no. units at all, okay? okay? Never mind. Because it's AU divided by AUs. This is why this is a relative force. So what do you get when you do this? 2.314. 2. Point what? Does it matter which one you divide by? Oh, yes. Oh, vastly, yes. <laughs> How will we know? Because I tell you right here to take D1 and divide it by D2 oh. squared. Okay. Well, I mean, but like what, were, what would happen if you were just supposed to like give it two distances? You want to do that to us? Okay, that sounds good. Okay, so you got 2.31. So what that means is that you're going to come out here when Mercury is at its closest point, and you're going to draw a line 2.31 centimeters long pointing towards the sun. So what this means is this. Compared to its greatest distance, when Mercury is at its closest point, that gravitational force is 2.31 times greater than what it is right now. And you think, well, that's not that big a deal. Think about this. Let's say you work at a job right now and you're making $10 an hour. And your boss comes up to you and says, you know, you've been working hard. I'm going to increase your salary by 2.31 times. You're going to go from $10 an hour to, yeah, about 22 bucks an hour. That's a hefty change. You know, you're going from $10 an hour to 22 bucks an hour. That's pretty significant. I take that, okay? Yeah, I take that all day long. So, listen to me. A couple of things. These are not Newtons. We are not saying that there's 2.31s of Newtons of force acting on 
mercury when it's at its closest. All we're saying is that whatever that force is, is 2.31 times greater at its closest point than it is at its furthest point. Okay, that's all we're saying. These are not Newtons. These are not the actual force. Now, here's the other thing that I want you to, that I, and I didn't have you draw it on your map because it was, it was going to get real convoluted if you do. But here's what I want you to realize as well. Not only is Mercury pulling on the Sun relative 2.31 times greater, that's pulling this way. Mercury is pulling out on the Sun 2.31 times greater. So to really do this right, you would need to draw an arrow going out that way showing, oh, Mercury is also pulling on the Sun. Because everybody thinks, oh yeah, man, Mercury is pull being pulled by the Sun. And it is. But guess what? Mercury is going, hey, I can play this game too. I'm going to pull back on the Sun with that relative amount of force. Okay? So don't think this force only goes in one direction. It doesn't. The mercury is pulling back on the sun with that same amount of force. Okay? So here's what you're going to do. You're going to go out here and you're going to pick a couple of other points. Okay? This is awkward. Oh, okay. Why are you carrying this? What is it? It's the photo one. You're in. Okay. Yeah. Oh. I bought Am the 13-year one, not the other one. Yeah. I'm in it. I'll put it on there real fast. I would also like to see it. Oh, I'm your friend's <laughs> Awesome. Next to you. Oh, so I've been listening. I was the one who was really doing that. Sorry. <laughs> Do you want to see it real quick? <laughs> okay, I'm done. Okay. I'm done. Oh, you're in hey, it. You're done. It's just too deep to look at it. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Oh, I am not. I'm 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 not. i am not i am not are going to be different. So what we're, in the, what we're going to keep constant, okay, is D2. So that value of D2 when it's at its greatest point is going to stay the same. So what you're going to do is you're going to pick your own D1 points. One on one side of the orbit, one on the other side of the orbit. And you're going to calculate that relative amount of force. Now clearly, what is that, what two values does your relative force have to be between? No, 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 the relative force. It has to be between one. It has to be between one and 2.31. Okay? Because 2.31 is at its greatest and one is at its smallest. So you're going to go through and you're going to pick those points. So you're going to write down those values. You're going to show me those calculations. And then when you get them drawn, you're going to have those vectors drawn on there. So here's what you're going to have when you get done. Okay, when you get done with this graph, I should clearly be able to see four vectors, one centimeter, 2.31, and the two that you just picked, okay? I should be able to see those four vectors. I should be able to see the single point when it's going fastest, the single point when it's going slowest, when it's slowing down, when it's speeding up, and then the three regions shaded in that you used to find the area back when we started this, okay? So, four arrows, two points, two regions, three shaded areas, okay? So, do that, bro. Stop the camera for a second. Okay, so now we need to roll this all into one big idea that encompasses Kepler and Newton, okay? So start with this idea. As Mercury goes around the sun, is the gravitational force constant? No, because the distance changes. Okay. When is the force the greatest? When it's closest. When it's closest. Okay. 
So we got that idea. Yes. Okay. Is there a centripetal force acting on mercury? Yes. yes. How do you know? Because it's in a circle. Moving in a circle, Moving in a circle right? Because mercury, at any given instance, wants to do what? Inertia. Mercury wants to go in a straight line because it has a mass, because it has inertia, right? Yes. It wants to go in this direction. True? Yeah. True that. Okay, true that. Yep. So here's the deal. So what's the direction of that centripetal force? In. Inwards at a 90 degree angle. Of the vector. To yeah. your velocity vector. Now, here's yeah. the question. What's creating that centripetal force? Gravity. 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 We could tie a string between Mercury and the Sun. Yeah. Okay. Possibility. Might get a little, probably tough to keep that from burning through. Okay. We could have the planets driving around on little, like, invisible tracks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, they got little wheels and they go around. Yeah. It's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Not saying it's happening, but it's a possibility. Or we just let gravity do the work. Yeah, gravity seems like the most logical explanation. So this is where these two things go hand in hand. Now, here's what we're going to look at. Centripetal force, remember, we've got to go old school on this, equals mv squared over r. True? True. Yes. Now, is this the mass of Mercury or the mass of the Sun? The mass of Mercury. 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 Why? Because it's like the stopper lab. Where the exactly. Stopper. That's what's going around in the circle. The sun oh, is stationary. Yeah. Okay? Oh. The sun is anchored. This is Mercury's mass. Okay? So this is the mass O Mercury. Now, this is where we hearken back to Kepler's laws. Okay? So this is where all of this gets interwoven in one idea. When does Mercury have its greatest velocity? When it's closest or when it's furthest away? Closest. 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 So when Mercury is at its closest point, it has its biggest velocity. Okay, not only does it have a big velocity, that velocity is getting squared. Okay? Ooh. Ooh. That's Ooh. big er. That's big. Uh -huh. Big. Huge. Okay, right? <laughs> But, but, when it's closest, what happens to the radius? When it's closest? Yes. The radius is smaller. It's smaller. So that's bigger than big. Bigger than big. Okay, that's a quantifiable thing, bigger than big. So the centripetal force is bigger than big when it's closest for two reasons. Why? Because radius You have a big velocity, that is? Squared. Squared. And your radius is smaller. And your radius is small. So you're dividing by a small radius. You have a bigger than big velocity that gets squared that makes it bigger squared, right? Yeah. And then the mass is mercury. So when the planet is closest, what happens to the amount of centripetal force that is required? It goes up. So this together is going to create a bigger than big Centripetal force oh, when Mercury is closest. That's a huge, okay. huge, huge. Okay. Now, conveniently, conveniently, what happens to the amount of gravitational force when Mercury is closest? It's increasing. Oh, it's wow. also bigger. Coincidence? I think not. I think not. <laughs> so, here's the deal. You have to have more gravitational force acting on Mercury when it's closest because it's going faster with a smaller radius. So what's happening is that imagine that this is in your house and you have like a banister that's like on a set of stairs. So what's happening is like imagine here's this banister and you're running along and you grab a hold of that thing and you like slingshot yourself around. Okay, if you've never done that, it's fun. I highly recommend it. So this is what's happening with Mercury. Mercury is getting slingshotted around the sun. It's going really fast. You have a small radius. You're going to need a tremendous amount of force. And conveniently, since gravity is providing that force, the gravitational force increases as it gets closer. Now, it has to go that way. You couldn't say, well, 
We need more centripetal force than Mercury is closest, but gravity actually becomes weaker. Okay? It couldn't happen, right? You could not have these opposite extremes. You couldn't say, well, I need a lot more force, but eh, gravity's just not showing up. Okay, well then what else is there? Okay? Yes. Wait, so like what you're trying to say is that because the centripetal force is caused by gravity, that's why they have to both increase? Yes. Okay. So conveniently, the gravitational force is getting stronger because, and it has to go that way because you need more centripetal force because you're going faster with a smaller radius. Okay? Okay. Now, the opposite happens. What happens when you go out here to the far reaches of that orbit? Now what's going to happen to your centripetal force? Same mass, right? Decrease. But the velocity is becoming smaller. smaller. In radius. But what's happening to the radius? It's bigger than big. It's getting bigger, so you're dividing by a bigger number. So therefore, you need a smaller amount of centripetal force. Guess what? What happens to your gravitational force? It becomes smaller because you're dividing by a bigger radius. Okay? Sam's back there. Woo, woo. Okay. I'm, I'm playing peekaboo with Mason. Really? That's yeah. awkward. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because you're both wearing red. Is that it? No, no, I've been doing it since the start of class. Like, the past, really like, two it. weeks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can stop now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So, here's the opposite extreme. When it's furthest away, guess what? You don't need as much centripetal force. Guess what? Gravity becomes less. So at this point, you should be able to answer questions one, two, and three. Okay? Now, so stop that. Think through questions one, two, and three. Okay. So here's going to be the last calculations that you need to do. So on questions four and five on that last page, even though we've been talking about Mercury traveling in an ellipse, we're actually going to calculate the value of that force, but we're going to make an assumption that on average, there's going to be a certain distance from Mercury to the sun, okay? So even though it's an ellipse and that force is always changing, we're going to say, okay, on average, here's the distance between Mercury and the sun. So in number four, you want to use Newton's equation, this F sub G, this gravitational force. You want to calculate the gravitational force between Mercury the sun, and you have that distance. Now, I've already given you that distance in meters. You don't have to do anything to it. It's not in kilometers, okay? It's in meters. So all you have to do on number four, this is a straight plug and chug kind of thing. You know what big G is. You have the mass of the sun. You have the mass of mercury and the orbital radius. Just plug that in, okay? Now, don't get hung up on whether we use d squared or r squared, okay? It's just a distance between the two objects. So typically, if you're talking about Mercury orbiting around the sun, we'll write that as r squared because that's an orbital radius. If I'm talking about the distance between Jack and the fire extinguisher, I'm going to put d squared, okay? It's just the distance between two points. Don't get, don't get completely hung up on that. Now, when you get to number five, then you're going to calculate the centripetal force needed to keep Mercury in orbit around the Sun. Now, what units is that force going to be in? Lord Newtons, right? Yeah. Which have units of kilograms, meters per square, right? Notice that I've given you the period as... 88 days. What are you going to have to do with the days? Change it into seconds. Change it into seconds. So do the calculations for four, do the calculations for five, and then if you do that right, the answer to number six should be fairly self-evident. And when you get that all done, we're finished. So when you get finished, when you get finished, here's what I want. So let me see the left. You're going to have, count them, three pieces of paper. So when you get done, I want the lab itself on top. 
then I want the graph, and this one, then I want to see, <laughs> I want to see just the three shaded regions that you use to find the area. Okay? And then it's going to go like that. Boom. <laughs> Screw it up. Stay put. There you go. So, stop you on the camera. Yes. Oh All right. God. So, and you won't have any homework tomorrow, I guess. Oh, oh my God. But, yeah. but Don't I test test? the next assignment that you get, oh, it's a doozy. Oh. oh. I'm just telling you. It's just the gravity. Yeah, exactly. okay. okay, so then we're just going to start a theoretical discussion. Okay? So let's say that we want to find the gravitational attraction between Maggie and the Earth. Okay, I'm going to show you three different ways you can do this calculation. Calculation number one. Maggie. At the end of Maggie's left index finger, there's a strand of DNA. And in that strand of DNA, there's a nitrogen atom. And in that nitrogen atom, there's a nucleus. And in that nucleus, there's a single proton. Actually, DNA can So leave that single proton <laughs> is attracted to every particle that makes up the earth. Okay? It's true. So that single proton in the end of her finger in that strand of DNA, there's one proton that's attracted to the entire earth. So what we could do is we could go F equals big G, the mass of that one proton, the mass of another proton on the earth divided by D squared. So what we would do is we would do this calculation for every proton that's in Maggie's finger, and how much it is attracted to every electron, proton, and neutron that makes up the Earth. Okay? We'd have to know the location of every electron, proton, and neutron that makes up the Earth, how far apart each of these particles are away from that proton, and then you do that calculation. Then when we get done with that, then we go to the proton beside that one. <laughs> And we do all these calculations again. And then we do that for all seven protons. And we do that for all seven neutrons. We'd all do that for all the seven electrons. Mm. And then we do that for every particle that makes up Maggie. Mm. And it would take us a lifetime of lifetimes to do these calculations. But here's what I want you to understand. We're not going to do this, obviously. But what I want you to understand conceptually is that what's creating that gravitational attraction is that every particle that makes up Maggie is attracted to every particle that makes up the Earth, which is true of all of us. It isn't just Maggie. It's like, oh, Maggie, you're the chosen one, okay? No, that, that's true of all of us. Every particle that makes up you is attracted to every particle that makes up the Earth. Obviously, we're not going to do this calculation, but hold that thought until tomorrow. Okay. Thank you so much.